We have with us today um, one of the giants, I think, of Latin music and music from New York City over the last four decades. In fact, this is your 40th anniversary, isn't it, this year, of making music? Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, Mr. Joe Baton has been making pioneering sounds since 1966. He began with the doo soul sound, moved into Boogaloo, uh, was a pioneer of salsa and Fania Records, was one of the first people signed to Fania Records, um, moved on and pioneered the South Soul, Latin Soul business and the South Soul record label, um, which we all know about. Many of us have the records in our crates uh, to this day. And then he made one of the first rap records. In fact, before Rapper's Delight, he had a record called Rappo Clapo. So we have a lot of stuff to talk about today, but please join me in welcoming the legendary Mr. Joe Baton. So, Joe, you're from Spanish Harlem, El Barrio. I've been told. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about, you know, a lot of us, um, uh, some of us have been to Spanish Harlem, a lot of us have not. Tell us about sort of the musical vibes and the, the street vibes that you uh, kind of experienced when you were growing up okay. in that area. Uh, before I do that, I'd like okay. to explain something to everyone here because, you know, a lot of times you come and you meet an artist and you really don't know anything about them. In my latter years, I've learned uh, to share with my audience what I do, my life, what I'm about, to show how it affects my music. You might uh, be a fan of my music and not know anything about me. It goes hand in hand. And when I thought about coming to Australia, I was talking to my wife and Peter, who's with me, I said, wow, we went all the way to Australia, another mm -hmm. continent. I said, we can't pass this up. He says, we think we can make the trip? It was very difficult. Mm -hmm. And yet, I knew I had to come here. I said, what do I have to offer? I always ask myself that question. Um, having been a self-taught musician, I said, well, gee, I do have 40 years in the business. And that's the only thing that I can offer you is to show you my world experiences and how I was involved in music and the roads and turns that it took me. And maybe that will help you only if you're interested in a career in music and knowing the pain and the struggle that was involved in the past. Uh, like everything else, you must know your history. You must know how the music business was then and before that and how it is today. Uh, they talk about selling records out of the you know, trunk of your car and rap artists did that. I did that in the 60s. Mm -hmm. I learned the business of sales, uh, how to get a record played on the radio, I went through the whole payola bit. I went through the gangsters that told me that they wouldn't play my record. I went full circle from Morris Levy, the same things that Frankie Lyman went through. And I want to share that with you so that you know my story. And it wasn't just uh, a fly-by-night thing, you know, that I wanted to do this and I went to school. No, I couldn't afford to go to school. Actually, I did a stint in the reformatory. Uh, I did five years uh, for being a bad boy. I was the neighborhood tough kid that had aspirations of doing something. And then, of course, in New York, we always tried to find shortcuts. And at that time, being of a minority, there were only two ways that you could make it in life. And that was either you were an entertainer or you were an athlete. I struck out as an athlete because I was too short. I wanted to be a basketball player. <laughs> I couldn't reach the rim. Uh, and then music came along, and that sort of saved my life. Uh, the universal language, uh, God blessed me. And I'm just so happy that I'm here today uh, to speak to you about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, without further ado, Jeff said, what about growing up in East Harlem? It seemed to be a mystique because I hadn't done anything for maybe the last 10, 15 years. I was stagnant. Uh, you know how you lose your confidence if you don't do something continuously? And I was no different. It happened to me. I had all the success uh, with different forms of music, and here it was, I was idle. Mm. Didn't know anybody, the music business was changing. I had seen it change maybe four or five times. So what do you do? <coughs> Your contacts are gone. You don't know anybody. There are different younger people creating the music. The same doors that you went in before are not open anymore. So lo and behold, what had happened, um, growing up in East Harlem, it was 
a constant struggle to find out exactly what the heck do you do. I came out of prison. And uh, I was always an advocate of singing in the streets and the hallways, having my hand cuffed over my ear to get an echo in the subways station so we could do harmony. I learned harmony before I could even read. Um, and most of that was done by ear. That ear training is so, so important. I don't know if I would have been able to develop my style if I would have went vice versa, if I was a student and had those opportunities to do those things and with the absence of the feeling and the emotion that I put into my songs. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I was very fortunate to accomplish what I did in such a short time. Uh, after being released, I went to the neighborhood. And you have to realize, back then, our form of entertainment was the radio. TV wasn't really a hot issue back then. We grew up every Saturday morning listening to the hit parade. And what played was Patti Page, Frank Sinatra, Tony Bennett, uh, the Four Lads, guys like that. And once in a while, we get Nat King Cole or Prince Prado. Uh, and that was the extent of my upbringing with music. So as you can see, my first influences were with white singers. And of course, that involved my style also in my diction and how I pronounce word. Now, you have to understand, when you listen to records, not everyone you understand, if you really have to bend your ear, if you're from a native tongue, you can find out some people, they mutter their words and they talk, and that comes from a lot of soul sometimes, and sometimes it comes from just a way of growing up. So all these influences, I found myself actually pronouncing the words. So that was an important part of how I developed my style, and I explained mm. that. Mm. Now, when I came out, I this was is uh, 64. Yeah, 64. Yeah. I was looking for a band, <clears throat> and prior to that, I had sung in the hallways, but nothing really serious. And I found these group of kids that were in the auditorium at William Edinger Junior High School in 106th Street. Uh, these are after my gang days. Actually, I was a member of the Dragons, uh, the neighborhood gangs that we had rivals in that neighborhood for many years with the Viceroy's. And that was just a way of life. You didn't come to our neighborhood, we didn't go to your neighborhood. So despite all those other things and the ambitions that you had, you had to fight with this peer pressure, this tremendous peer pressure where uh, people didn't like you because what you wore or you were from a different nationality and you couldn't walk down our block or you were lighter than I was and you were darker or we didn't like the way you dress. All those things surviving and still trying to make it in life and still trying to go to school, very difficult. And the other thing about it too is um, you are of Filipino and Black, African-American right. descent, mm -hmm. but everybody thought you was Puerto Rican. Well, you get that argument. That was the argument for so many years. It never mattered to me. <clears throat> I didn't grow up with a, with a prejudiced bone in my body. I mean, I went to kids with Jewish kids, Japanese kids. That's just the way I grew up, not everybody else. Uh, and being of Filipino uh, heritage, my father was from Manila. My mother was black. She was from Newport News. But here I was in the midst of Spanish Harlem, so I had to learn the language. So all my friends were Puerto Rican. And I spoke Puerto Rican and I blended right in. And they would fight you, they would take you downstairs and chop your head off if you said it was anything else. And that was the argument for years. After they used to hear my songs on the radio, people would swear, yeah, that's a Latino guy, boy, he's great. That's my man, Joe Batan. And the other brother would come along and say, what are you talking about, homeboy? He said, that boy's a brother, man, and his mother's from Newport. And he said, you wrong. And that argument kept going on for years, back and forth, back and forth. What is he? Nobody even knows. He still asks me today. And what I try to tell everybody, I'm universal. Mm. Right? I'm mm. rainbow. Mm. I got mm. a little bit of everything in me. Mm. Uh, even my kids got more. They are, they, they are actually, I married a Puerto Rican, so they have Puerto Rican blood, so they have the full spectrum. But, um, but so the music that you were listening to back then, well, I told you, I went through a transition. I yeah, wanted yeah. to get that feel of it. I grew up Patty Page and that run, and then along came Alan Freed, and he introduced rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And it was like something that we had never heard before. They hear Frankie Lyman, <clears throat> Lyman sing, Why the Fools Fall in Love. Who was this kid with a, with a girl's voice that was singing so high? Boys didn't do that. He sang with a lower register, you know. Like the, wow, Michael, the Michael Jackson of, exactly. of, uh, he was of Michael that Jackson time. Yeah. At that time. Uh -huh. And uh, we tried to imitate these groups, and then along came Chef and the Limelighters and the Heartbeats, and I went back to prison. Uh, mm. I violated parole, and I did another stint up there, and I tried to uh, 
polish up my, my, my music while I was up there. I was under the tutelage of a Mark Francis. He was a graduate of the Manhattan Conservatory. That really has nothing to do with me because he couldn't get me to read a lick. When it came to theory, I was hands down. I could never, never, never follow the, those theory notes and stuff that he wanted me for your training. But nevertheless, he would never let us touch our instruments if we didn't read or if we didn't know our theory. And uh, knowing our minor six and major thirds and such and such and such was all Greek to me, um, I finally survived and got out of there and got a band. Uh, the group of kids that were in that auditorium that day were 11, 12, and 13 years old. And why I say that is because it was a bit of history. They were the youngest band in Latin music. It was unheard of anybody that young mm. to break into this business. I was 19. I was the oldest. When I walked into that auditorium, I stuck a knife into the piano. Of course, I was the neighborhood thug. <laughs> and all the kids looked at me. They knew my reputation. I said, I'm the leader of the band. And I, they all looked at me like, yeah, yeah, you're the leader, no problem. <laughs> so they all looked at me, and, and, and I said, if you follow, follow me, I'll take you into heights that you've never achieved before in your life. Of course, I was a very good spieler, you know, with, with my gift of gab. And of course, they followed me. My only problem I had was I had to convince their parents, because I was a neighborhood, uh, what you call titere in the neighborhood. Nobody wanted their kids with me. So I walked them home every night after rehearsal. And I had to convince the parents, look, let them play with me. I'll bring them home every night. No, we don't want, we don't want you doing with just. I don't do that stuff anymore. I'm playing music. I want to do something with my life. Yeah, well, we want to see. Eventually, I had made this promise to these kids that were 11, 12 years old. They had horns, the second hand horns that had holes in them. We patched up some drums. We had cans, whatever we could get. And we practiced in that auditorium for three hours a day for six months. And the reason why I say six months, because in six months, we were making records. Mm. Uh, the story is unheard of. It's like a Cinderella story. Because here with these kids, they didn't know their left foot from their right. None of them had any inkling of rhythm, how to dance. They just knew that they had the instruments, and we polished them up together. We learned together as an entity. And what had happened was the singer that we had was named George Pagan. And he sort of had a Spanish accent. And at that time, the boogaloo was starting to happen. You know, there had been success with Watusi, Bang Bang by Joe Cuba, I Like It Like That, and Boogaloo, boogaloo Blues. And uh, he was attempting to do this song in English. And uh, we were trying to explain to him, look, you need to pronounce the words a certain kind of way. And he got upset. And he said, look, you know so damn much. Why don't you do it yourself? <laughs> so I attempted to do the song, and the rest was history. I haven't stopped singing since. Uh, the guy said, hey, Joe, you do the songs. And uh, that was it. George Golder, who was responsible for Roulette Records and a lot of those big acts on Coltique, heard me sing for the first time. And he actually said, look, you don't want to sing. He said, you sound too sweet. We need somebody like James Brown. And I'm glad that I didn't listen to him, because I walked away from him. And eventually, I got a contract with Fania Records. Mm -hmm. And we recorded Gypsy Woman mm -hmm. uh, at Beltone Studios on 33rd Street. That day is interesting, because you got to imagine, here's a youngster that's 19, 20 years old with a bunch of young kids that I had nurtured. We had rehearsed. We had no charts. Everything was in our heads. All the music, every break, every beat was in our heads. The discipline that was needed to put something like that over, I can't even imagine to tell you. If I finished this way, they knew what that meant. Hmm. Right? If I said, give me two, they knew. That's how the rehearsals, intense they were. And that you only could have done it probably with that, that uh, group of youngsters, because you couldn't get a bunch of adults to listen to some of that crap. You know, me telling them, hey, you got to do this, and you got to dance that way. It was because those kids were young <coughs> that I was able to do that. And what had happened when we got into that studio, I don't know if you normally know how they record. You normally call the rhythm section in first. You put down that track, then you bring in the horns. Then you bring in the strings. Well, we sat there, and I believe the recording director was Johnny Pacheco. He says, are you guys ready? He said, yes. I sat down in the piano, and I sang every song in that album while I played the piano, which is unheard of. You normally overdub, right? And everybody else played. We were so nervous that they were going to tell us to leave. And this was our great opportunity that we finished the whole album in four hours. <laughs> unheard of. Uh, the guy was amazed, and he said, well, don't you want some more time to come back? I said, no, no, please, sir, please. 
By the ninth song, I started to lose my voice. And you could hear this raunchiness, which I have now. It stays with me <laughs> um, on the last song. And eventually, that became a style of mine. He said, leave that in. That gives it a soul approach. What was that last song? That was Ordinary Guy. I was on my last breath, because I didn't want this guy to throw me out of the studio. Why don't know? we play that? OK. Yeah? Play it, sure. OK. <laughs> this is Ordinary Guy. 1966, I believe. <laughs> That that's like I like to identify myself. You can always find me talking to my audience at a gig, as you'll find if some of you will come tomorrow. Um, that I like to share. I like to talk. I enjoy this business, and that's the one ingredient that most people should bring to the table if you're going to get involved with music. There's no sense doing this just for the love of money, because forget it, you can go broke. I mean, if you don't have the proper timing for a hit record, if you don't know the proper people, you're going to get rip ripped off. If you don't know this business of music, you don't stand a chance. So besides learning your craft, you must know the business end of this whole uh, magnificent uh, world of music. Because without it, uh, you won't relish the rewards, and you'll be sorry. You'll be crying the blues for another 30 years, wondering what happened to the talent mm -hmm. and the financial end of it that you didn't get. Mm -hmm. That's some truth speaking right there. Let's um, talk a little bit about the stylistic changes that kind of happened. You had Ordinary Guy there, and you can really hear. I actually, I didn't even hear the raunchiness in the voice. Okay, Did you it, was guys? There. it was there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was beautiful. Um, like but the, uh, the other stuff that you guys are working with on this, on this particular record included Boogaloo, included right. um, the sound that became Gypsy known as Salsa right. and that kind of thing. Um, so. Tell us a little bit about okay. all of these other d different types of influences, and maybe well, we can play some of the other music Gypsy as well. Gypsy Woman, of course, everybody knows that was a K Curtis Mayfield song. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I turned out to have another type of style where I could pick songs. I knew songs that had the potential to be something, <laughs> even if they were before. I knew that I could embellish on certain songs and attempt to do them differently, that people might get a refreshing um, ear to. And this is what I did with the first song, which was recorded, Gypsy Woman. I took the same song, which I learned, and put different music to it, used the same lyrics, changed the beat, and we had what you call a cha-cha with a backbeat. Mm. And it was Gypsy Woman. Mm. OK, let's play that. Actually, this is one of the first songs that crossed over into the American field. Ah, uh, okay, see I, see, I see, I <laughs> <laughs> But actually, that was one of my first songs, and it crossed over to the American feel and sort of put Joe Batan on the map. Because I was really gearing for the Latin community, and here it was, I was able to get a black audience also, because for the first time, and for a long time, you had people that loved Latin music, but they didn't understand it. Mm. You couldn't understand the music, but I said, que pasa, vamos aquí. You know, you didn't know what I was talking about. So what it did, it allowed the other masses of people that normally wouldn't listen to Latin music because it was, it was done in Spanish to actually listen to this. So to them, it was something new, and somebody coined it Boogaloo. I like to call it Latin soul. Mm. And that's why I probably have survived the other Boogaloo artists, because I did have uh, the mindset to change and say that I was doing Latin soul. And that's what I've been known for for the last 40 years. Now, you have said something really, really interesting in interviews, which is that um, Boogaloo, you think, as a style, uh, which had its heyday pretty much from about 66 to 68, 69 or so, was actually um, run off the air, was, was right. actually suppressed. Yeah. And that's a really interesting uh, thought. I mean, a lot of people feel like, oh, well, the kids are dancing to it for a little while, but there was a new dance that came along, they did something oh. else, blah, 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 blah. But you're actually saying that a lot of the... Uh, Mambo folks, the Mambo Kings, the, the, the sort of folks that the were, yeah, the purists, the folks that were really into their Wabanco or their Descargas or that, or whatever, they had chased actually suppressed us. the music. Yeah? They chased us off the air. The story has come out, it took maybe 40 years to find out what actually happened. If they ever do a movie about it, the truth will come out. Actually, the Boogaloo saved Latin music. Uh, there were times where a lot of the Jewish population, the black population, used to go out dancing. When the Boogaloo came about, it was so tremendous, it was similar to the uh, twist. And people were flocking from everywhere to see people dance in a, in a hall, everybody stomping their feet and clapping their hands uh, in harmony. 
uh, that a lot of those purists and bands that have been playing with the Prince Prados, Xavier Kubats, Tito Puentes along, couldn't follow in the same vein. You got to understand, and I'm sure you might know this when you get people to play in your groups or you invite people over your house to listen to music. You can take a black person that normally has a, a history of soul and that doesn't listen to Latin music, and then you attempt to tell him to play Latin music and use a clave, he doesn't know that. The same thing is true for the Latino who has grown up listening to guaguancó, mambos, and cha-chas. He has no inkling of the backbeat or what's happening in R&B. So when you put those people into your group, hmm. there's a teaching process. I've been able to do it. Mm -hmm. I've had all kinds of play. But if you find the purists, they normally keep to their own gender of people that play the music. That doesn't happen anymore. But it was happening like that for a long time in the business. It was very difficult, and it still is, to find <coughs> bands that could play both authentically. That means to play on clave and to really hit it back and do harmony and do doo-wop or disco. So the story goes um, back in the schools when it came to prom time in June, June when they were having their high school graduations. The kids would all get together and they would say, look, we want to have cooling gang at our graduation. Uh, it was all the black kids. Then all the Latino kids got up and said, no, 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 no. We want Tito Puente. Hmm. So because they couldn't agree, they said, look, you know what we can do? Let's get Joe Batan. <laughs> and for that reason, I got a lot of the work in New York back then because I was able to play both. You know, so <laughs> I was fortunate. <laughs> um, sometimes it doesn't work for you. I mean, this business is a tough business. I mean, I've always been on the outskirts of almost, almost always making it big time. Maybe it's a blessing, and I keep missing. Uh, someone wrote in England that, uh, yeah, he's a, an honorary cuss. He's always fighting with the record producers and the companies, and that's partly true. The only part that he said is I was still pumping gas in East Harlem, that wasn't true. <laughs> uh, uh, but nevertheless, uh, I did have a lot of arguments because I felt what's right and what belongs to me, and that comes from my mother. She was four feet nine. She used to fight for me in school. Mm. All right? And I believe that if I'm right about something, there's no damn way in hell that I'm going to succumb and sell myself out short of making a dollar. So for a long time, Joe didn't make any dollars. I'm probably making a couple of dollars an hour. But I'm very wealthy. I'm wealthy because I have my health and strength. I have a family. I got my home that I had. I'll tell you that story. Um, and a lot of other things that people did in their life successful are not here any longer. Right? I'm not a youngster. I'm younger than the sun, but I'm, I've, been, I've seen a couple of uh, decades. I've been through the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and here I am here today. So God has blessed me. <laughs> yeah. And I want to bring you the message, so you'll hear that tomorrow. <laughs> but um, as I said, it was very difficult, and uh, I was able to make those transitions. So because after that era, when the boogaloo came, uh, I believe it was... Uh, well, actually, can I stop? Yeah, you? sure. This, this remark on the back. Okay. Because part, um, part of what I think is really incredible about your story is, is exactly that, the, the fact that you ended up trying to fight for artist yes. rights yes. all the time. With, and you were working I, with some of the most, um, well, you know, know, you don't want to speak well, of the dead or people that you right. don't know, but some of the most, you know, uh, notoriously, I guess, the stories about their exploitation of artists were really, really deep. Yeah. People like Morris Levy from Roulette, right. um, the Tico folks and that kind of thing. You yeah. didn't sign with them no. because you actually figured out a way to work it. Right. Uh, well, let me tell level. the story. Tell the I'm story. Good at that. Yeah. Uh, here I am in New York trying to get a recording contract, and everybody's trying to grab a hold of Joe Batan. Everybody's trying to rip me off silently. All right? The one thing you must know, and I'm going to share that with you, know, Joe Batan is not my name. Uh, Batan is my first name. My last name is Nitalano, all right? The Joe came about when I was about to play in a club one day, and a business card that I had said, call Joe Batan O'Common. So the guy thought my name was Joe Batan, and he put it on the card, and he started advertising me all over the place. <laughs> and I said, whoa, it sounds great, Joe Batan, a new identity. And what you did, it's changed my life. Because that gangster guy, the guy that they knew that was always causing trouble, they didn't know he was the same guy. So when people came to see me play, said, I know him. That guy, he's the guy that took my coat in high school. You know? Yeah, that's him. 
I'm going to tell you a funny story because it's embarrassing now, you know. Uh, a guy called me up for a venue in Las Vegas. And he said, Joe, we'd like to get you to play in Vegas. I said, yeah, I'd like to come down. I haven't been down there. He says, yeah, you remember me? I'm from East Harlem. I used to be up there a long time ago. I said, yeah. I said, OK, what's your name? He said, Winston. I said, great. He says, yeah, man, I remember the old days, you know? He said, you know, you took my coat once, <laughs> but you gave me back my hat. <laughs> I was so embarrassed, you know? But um, those stories you come about, and um, as I said, life was a little, a little difficult, and... Uh, so you're talking about the record labels? And yeah, the record labels. Were, were... I was going in, and I went into Roulette Records, which was notorious at that time. If you saw the Frankie Lyman story, the guy with the big cigar, that was Morris Levy. He was a gangster. All right? And um, I walked in there, and I was with a Jose Cubello, who was a band leader. And he said, come here, son. I'm going to show you how to do this. And he says, you know what publishing is? I said, no. He says, we're going to try to get you the publishing. I said, okay. Morris Levy was sitting there with his big cigar. And he says, all right, what do you want? You know, and he, he put everything. This when they first had intercoms on the telephones, you know. I said, well, he said, Mo, the kid wants to record. But he's scared. What is he scared about? He says, Symphony said, said he won't play his records unless he signs with him. He's, excuse my language. He says, that faggot, get him on the phone right now. Put him on the phone. He gets him on. The guy's waking up. He says, Sid. He said, yeah, Mo, what do you want, Mo? I'm sleeping. He said, you faggot, you told this young kid that you're not going to play his records because he won't sign with you? What are you talking about? I got a kid over here, some kid named Joe Batan. He says, ah, I don't remember. He says, well, you little fuck, you work for me, and you do what I tell you. You hear me? Yeah, Mo, yeah, yeah. He said, okay, kid, what else <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting here. You got to realize, I mean, back then, you know, and I'm looking and at Symphony the guy. And Symphony City is the biggest oh, radio guy. One of the biggest. It, yeah, the biggest, in, in, the, in, in the city, yeah. right. So he said, this, what else do you want? So I sort of whispered up, and I said, well, I'd like to get paid for the session. Said, All right, go ahead, you got it. What else do you want? I said, well... What about publishing? Publishing? What are you, a wise guy? Who taught you about publishing? Oh, shit. I said, well, I, I write songs. OK, we'll talk about that. What else? Well, I'd like some money up front. He said, get the fuck out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> you know? And then lo, lo and behold, George Goldner walks in, who was responsible for the Chantels and a lot of big groups back then and R&B groups. And he sees me and he says, Mo, I know this kid. I got him signed to a contract. He said, what? Get the hell out of here. <laughs> Another guy walks in. He says, I know him too. I got him signed. <laughs> he said, well, you're a little wise-ass guy. You had he three says, different contracts you yeah, did. Well, so. you know, they were trying to rip me off. That was the only way I could protect <laughs> myself. I signed everything, Joe Batan. That wasn't my name. I knew one thing. As far as not having any degree in legal, I knew that if I signed my name and if it wasn't my name, you couldn't hold me. You could kill me, torture me, whatever. But if I found out if you were trying to crook me, you didn't have a, a binding contract. So that's what I did. I signed with everybody. I knew they were trying to rip me off, you know? Oh, me oh. So he says, you're a wise guy. We're going to fix your ass. He says... Get the hell out of here. You're not going to record with no one. Mm. So I walked out with my tail behind my back, and I said, gee, I really blew it. But lo and behold, somebody called me up at Dick Ricard. He says, you know, there's a young guy, ex-cop, that's starting a record label with Johnny Pacheco. I'm going to send him down to see you. And if he likes you, maybe there's a record deal. So he came down. He liked. He was very nervous. He was probably as nervous as I was. And he asked me, well, what do you want? And I said <clears> the same thing. Hey, could I get the publisher? Yeah, he didn't know what the hell it was either. And uh, he paid me for the session, and the rest was history. I started making records. It wasn't the greatest deal, but at that time, it was probably the only deals. And what was I, the name of that label? Fanya Records. Today, it's owned by E Musica, and there's a resurgence in the boogaloo around the world. Uh, records are selling like hotcakes off the market, uh, from the UK all the way down to Italy, you name it. And, uh, E Musica is part of V2, mm -hmm. Virgin Records. Mm -hmm. Now, you um, ended up really becoming one of uh, Fania's biggest, biggest lights. Um, they had, of course, Willie Colon, um, and they had you and Ray Barreto, and, and I think the three of you were just like their, their top sellers uh, consistently. The world belonged to us. We were young, innocent. Mm -hmm. I mean, young, fresh, and wild, like one of my songs, that's, that was us. We were young, fresh, and wild. We had no inkling about tomorrow. We were living for the day. Mm. I mean, we did everything under the sun, you know. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you got to understand, the war 
in Vietnam had taken place. And, and uh, you know, unfortunately, there were nothing but girls left back in the neighborhoods. So there was like an abundance of sweethearts that we had, you know what I mean? Because everybody was over there fighting, you know? And uh, it was just one of those crazy days where they hanged out in the park and the hippie movement and LSD and all those things came into play. And uh, it was a growing experience. I mean, from that, I think I did go behind the Iron Curtain. I don't know if you want to go there yet. Oh, let's, let's, let's uh, stay with some of the music. Okay. Okay. So you made a record called Riot, and I want to play Riot. that song. The Riot was a song recorded by Smokey Robbins. As I said, I started getting good when I listened to songs and seeing that they had potentials. I said, you know, let me change the music around again. I used the words because Smokey, as I said, one of the greatest lyricists that the world has ever had. I believe he's one of, the, one of the most prolific writers of songs. If you really listen to his lyrics and see them, you will know what I'm talking about. Um, he wrote that song, and it was a B-side. Never thought that he was going to put it out for release, and I used that song, and I started to make it. Uh, it was called A Good, Good Feeling. Mm -hmm. And actually, when I incorporated the sounds and the conga and the cowbell and everything else with it, I called it the riot. It's a good, good feeling. And this song was so successful in New York in 1968 that it outsold every artist four to one. Actually, it went gold, and that was my first gold record. And uh, we used to play this song, and no one could follow us on stage because of the emotion and the high energy that it had. I think I played this song for an hour straight on a boat ride. And literally, when we did the conga line, which we will do tomorrow, we're going <laughs> to take you all the way up to the north. Um, and the boat started rocking. <laughs> They actually begged me. The state troopers came and the people were dancing. They wouldn't get off the stage because this riot song had that kind of emotion that people were just loving. If you ever danced to a song that you didn't want to end, that was the riot. Mm. Here we go. <laughs> it's like a baseball team or soccer team when you finally get everybody on the same wavelength. I mean, the routines that we had, the dancing, the, the, the audience participation was unheralded by that time in New York. I mean, it was the thing to do. Mm. And uh, I'm just happy that I was blessed to do it. Mm. The, you can hear, actually, the, the kind of emerging sound, too, of salsa in there. Right. What was, what was uh, salsa, what did it mean to New Yorkians in, in New York City at that time? Well, the, the word hadn't been coined yet. Uh -huh. It was starting to come in the 70s. Okay. It's always been around. We call it mambo, cha-cha-cha, you know, uh, guaracha, you know, the boogaloo. But salsa, the, the main name, hadn't evolved yet until later on in the 70s after Yankee Stadium concert. Mm -hmm. you know, salsa actually means sauce. So somebody coined the word and said, let's play salsa. And then it became a, a household name. Mm -hmm. And everything that followed that was completely salsa, which had a Latin connotation, was called that. Mm -hmm. But it was just basically a catch-all term for a lot right. of music. Right, exactly. It was just like rap out. had to get identified. They had no name for it. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what the heck it was. Mm -hmm. we, we would say, clap your hands at first, uh -huh. or stomp your feet, because that's what they were doing. Right. When the rap first rap songs I heard, right. they didn't know what it was. Nobody even gave it a name back then. I think I first had the first thing that said rap o clap o. Right. Right? Until right. after that, then they started to say, I mean, they had rappers, but nobody put the name. Right, right. I wanted to play another track here, too, to kind of show a little bit more about how you're developing the sound during, okay. the, during this era. And then we can come back to the story about East Germany. OK. Yeah? Sure. OK. Um, this is Nuevo Hala Hala. But if, if I recall correctly, there was, a, there was a dance called Hala Hala during the 60s, yeah? Right. Okay. And it was Richie Ray, Ricardo Ray, ah. had made it famous. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it was Hala Hala, I think he took from Colombia mm. when he had visited in South America. Mm -hmm. And then he brought it to New York, like a lot of those band leaders did. Like Willie Colon brought the, the Cumbia Cheche Cole, right. and that became an instant um, successful tune in New York. What you see is that a lot of those phases and crazes were bought from other countries. Mm -hmm. And people just didn't know about them, and they modernized them and put that to music, and then something was created again, just mm -hmm. like the clothes keep returning. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. everything mm -hmm. seems to have a cycle of repeating itself. You know, mm -hmm. but waiting then, for Beethoven. Was that waiting for Beethoven waiting for, yeah. to come back? <laughs> yeah, uh, you might have to bring him back next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so then salsa actually describes a wide range of different 
sounds then from all yeah. across. It wasn't their intention, yeah. but that's how it is. Uh, uh -huh. That's how it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, because if you spoke to somebody in Italy and you mentioned salsa, they're going to take the full spectrum in. Mm. But those purists mm -hmm. that did it in New York only meant their particular music. I see. I you see. see, they meant salsa for my heritage. Uh -huh. You see, but now it got bigger than them and everybody else mm -hmm. because now it's over three quarters of the world, mm -hmm. Latin music. Mm -hmm. And you should, it's important to note actually if you go out and get a lot of these records which have been reissued on Fania, Riot's been mm -hmm. reissued, and um, the other one, uh, uh, St. Latin's Day Massacre, right. has been reissued. And mm -hmm. you hear a whole bunch of different styles on the record, which was your sort of particular way of, of presenting. Right. Um, all of this kind of music. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, at the same time, salsa is becoming the sound of the new generation of New Yorkians and expressing brown pride and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so this led you to do um, other things, like you were going to go and actually do some work uh, in East Germany with Angela oh, Davis yes, and that yes, kind of yes, thing, yes, yeah? Yes. Um, <laughs> as sort of a representative of, right. of uh, you know, the, that heritage. Right. Well, I've yeah. always been... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, what do you say, person that didn't follow the norm. Mm -hmm. And I had played for the Young Workers uh, Liberation Party in a dance once, and young, some of the youngsters approached me. I guess I was naive at that time politically. And said, would I be interested in going to East Berlin? I said, East Berlin? How do, you, how do I get into East Berlin? Nobody's been in there. He said, no, mm. we got a way to get in. Would you, would you come with us? And I said, yeah, sure. You know? and then they said that I would go to uh, Moscow. And you have to understand, this is in 1973. And then when I found out it was Angela Davis, it was a great opportunity. And of course, I was discouraged from going. He said, Joe, if you go on this trip, you're going to be blackballed. Mm -hmm. Sort of like mm -hmm. the McCarthy era, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to think about it. I said, wait a minute. That's not my political views. I just want to go play music. He said, yeah, but you got to be careful. You know, people might start following you. I said, get out of here. Nobody's going to follow. Who's going to follow me with that cloak and dagger stuff? You know what I mean? And uh, I, I travel with these kids who become good friends of mine uh, throughout the years. Uh, you have to understand, there's no place I can go in the United States that I don't know somebody that I got a place to stay. And I did that for a long time. These people that I travel with, that Tent You for a Festival uh, was a melting sort of like you here. Uh, we didn't lose that. This is a great... Uh, great idea what uh, Red Bull is doing, bringing the minds together and bringing people together. Uh, don't lose it. Mm. Uh, it's so important. I'm glad that I didn't when I made that trip to, to East Berlin. Those people there are still my friends. Uh, they tried to educate me, and maybe I was too ignorant at the time because I was a musician first, not a political activist. Mm -hmm. But when I got to East Berlin, and here it is, you know, you got to understand, you're going to, of course, Checkpoint Charlie, right? And uh, I'm going there with Angela Davis, who was very notorious at that time in our own country, you know, of uh, being that what happened, and she had got locked up, the prison break, and everything. A brilliant lady. I had no idea the lady spoke nine languages. She was so adverse in uh, political science that I started to get a world reaction of what really hell was going on in the world besides mm. East Harlem. Mm. And when I made that trip, um, somebody had remarked about a young lady named, uh, I forget her name, she was on the run from uh, the FBI. I think her name was Shakir or something like Asada that. Asada Shakur. Yeah, Shakur, right. And she had went to someone's home looking for a refuge, and they turned her away. Uh, not knowing the particular party that she was with, it turned out to be a question. Mm. I said, well, gee, you're telling me that you're the Young Workers Party and you're working about workers' rights and you're talking about these things that are being done to you. Why did you turn that lady away? She said, well, we're not involved in that. We only go a certain distance as far as this political situation is concerned. And that doesn't involve us harboring people that are wanted by the FBI. I said, would you do that to your friend? And it became a question, like you have to ask yourselves. You know, you might make friends here. Somebody might have a belief. Do you turn that person away for fear of uh, getting damaged yourself, even though they might have uh, ideals that are right? So I was posed with the same kind of questions. So nevertheless, I made the trip. 
And when I got off the plane, I noticed something curious because here I was in a country that most people couldn't get into. And here is Joe Batan from Harlem sitting in East Berlin. Now what I noticed is when I went through West Berlin, it was very colorful, just like the United States. But as I crossed Checkpoint Charlie, the color started changing. Everything was drab. There was no red, there was no blue, it was only gray. And as I got along and walked down the streets, um, I started to notice the people. Everybody was young. There were no old people. And everybody greeted me. Everybody was so warm to me that I couldn't understand. Uh, it was the time of the Afro. <laughs> and I guess the East Berlin uh, Germans that were there hadn't seen too many blacks come through there or anybody with an Afro. So they come out of the street touching my Afro, man. I was a star. I was signing autographs for my Afro. Not because I sang. And I said, gee, what a country, you know? I mean, they lacked a lot of things. They didn't have, uh, like we know, ice. You know, refrigerators, they wanted modern equipment, which they were closed off to. But they explained to me that they had signed into law to outdo racism. And I thought that was really something. I said, well, why? She says, because after what had happened during the war, uh, we sort of outlawed that. I said, well, this is not at all like I thought it would be. She says, no, they keep telling the propaganda out there. And actually, we want to meet you. We don't care if you come in here. They don't want us to come out of here. Mm. And I made a lot of friends. Mm -hmm. I brought Joe Batan albums and spread them all over communist you Germany. Brought, you brought Riot out the there, riot, though, right? I would stop their customs, because if you ever see the Riot album, <laughs> I'll bring pictures tomorrow at the dance. Uh, it depicts violence, like a gang having fights. And the guy at customs said, what are you bringing this into our country? I said, well, I'm going to give it out to the people. He said, are you sure? And they gave me a hard time, but nevertheless, I got those records <laughs> in. Uh, mm -hmm. The rest was history. We had standing ovations everywhere we went. They were so appreciative of, of my music, and I found that was going to be something that was going to happen with my life all throughout Europe. Mm -hmm. And it followed so, so the same thing in Moscow mm -hmm. when I went there. Mm -hmm. So that was an experience that I hold on to. Um, and uh, meeting people from around the world with different ideals just to see for myself uh, what was going on. Of course, now you know we don't have any uh, Great Wall anymore, but uh, that's a part of history that I have and that I live with and I can tell about. Now, fortunately, during this period, you're also actually having, beginning to have a lot of issues with Jerry Masucci and yeah. Find Your Records and that kind of thing. And I was interested in finding out from you how you dealt with that. How did you react to... Oh. <laughs> um, the issues that you had with Jerry Masucci. First of all, what were some of those issues, and then what did you do about that? Well, everybody likes to get paid. You do records. I found myself changing a flat tire in East Harlem one day, and I didn't have the money to pay for it. And I said, what the hell is this shit? Joe Batan, my ass. I said, Joe Batan? Who the hell is Joe Batan? I can't even pay for the flat tire. So who was making the money? Hmm. I was so popular. Everybody knew me. I was like a household name. And I said, wait, well, something's wrong here. And I went up to him and I asked for my reviews. And he said, well, you know, the money that you made, uh, you're still in the, in the red for money that you owe us for the recordings. And things that you, we were ignorant about, which, you, which I explained you should know about the business. Um, and after that, I, I read it in the newspaper about a baseball team called the Brooklyn Dodgers. And they had two pitchers, two guys by the name of Sandy Koufax and Don Drysdale. And what these two gentlemen did they told the Brooklyn Dodgers to kiss their ass, they weren't going to pitch anymore. Hmm. And I took a little from them. And I sort of made history in the music business because I said, kiss my ass, I ain't making no more records. And he thought I was joking, and he made me starve for a year. But I held through to what I did, and he finally had to send somebody out. And we settled on something, and I got me a little co-op, but you know. But Not even much. before that, though, mm -hmm. you were actually talking to some of the other artists Oh, yes. On the label. I tried to organize a lot of the groups then. A lot of them sold out. I'm sorry to say that. Uh, they were satisfied with the crumbs or the few dollars that finally would give you and put your picture up on a, a, a poster or a billboard, and that was gratifying to them. But, uh, to me, it wasn't. I, that's probably why you'll probably never see me in the movie, our Latin thing, because mm. I refused to be on it. Those mm. guys didn't get paid uh, to this day. A lot of them 
don't have uh, benefits. They have no medical benefits. Mm. They have no insurance. They have nothing. It's time for people in the world, you youngsters out there, to start organizing when you get into those businesses to make sure that there's something. We're in the what, space age? Unheard of. Mm. Everybody has a union. Some of the musicians got nothing. Mm. And ain't nobody saying nothing. Even the DJ should organize, mm -hmm. you know, and, and get down to a, a union so that for protection for them. Why not? You know, it's just to be respected now. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a shame. It's like that guy said, I don't know, I saw him on TV, David Suzuki. He said, we got a lot of responsibilities, but we go around and most of the things that we talk about is Paris Hilton or Michael Jackson doing this or this guy throwing this guy off the window or this guy meeting this guy in the bathroom and we got issues. We got a water problem here in Australia. Right? We got all different things. We got different things around the world and we don't pay no attention to it. So the same thing for music. Um, I know the one ingredient that uh, David missed was that spiritual, which I believe very strongly, has a big part to play in that environmentalist thing that's happening in the world today because we're on a collision course. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, people like yourself will come together. There'll be some of you there with ideas about changing the scope of things to be done and to be done fairly for everybody, and you'll step forward and bring a lot of people with you. Mm -hmm. So, Joe, you actually, thank you for that, actually. Thank you. We should definitely. That's really important. Thank you. Joe, you actually had recorded something like eight albums for Fania mm -hmm. in the course of like four or five years. Right. And they couldn't figure out a way to give you what you were, what you were worth, really. Exactly. I mean, you had really helped build the label up and that kind of thing. But you decided, actually, at that point to break off. Um, you held out for a year. You actually started your own independent label, which right. was unheard of at that particular right. time for an artist to go ahead and do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you helped start up a little label that became known as Salso. Right. Can yeah. you talk a little bit about how that sure. started up? And, well, after and breaking were... with uh, Fania Records, Jeremiah Suchi, I finally had it. When I said, look, you got to let me go. And I sort of the gangster came into me. You know, I said, you got to let me go. You hear what I'm saying? And he's, I guess he knew that we weren't going to hit it off anymore because he was ripping me off and I wasn't going to make any records for him. And his interests were going otherwise. So finally he gave me my release one day. I'm sure he regretted it, thinking that I wouldn't be able to do anything. And, I, and as I said before, it's a lonely feeling once you're left. Once you get out of high school and you got to go someplace else, you start thinking about that next institution you're going to because you've been used to your friends for four years. It's just like I was used to the label. Now I'm looking and I'm searching, like you're searching Professor said uh, some time ago, by the time you're 30, you better know what you're doing for the rest of your life. And in music, it's the same thing. If you're going to pursue it, you better damn well know what you're going to do and by that age. You can't keep waiting and waiting and waiting, hoping that something's going to fall off the ceiling and hit your way. Um, he let me go, and I did some research, and there was a little label called Americana Records. They went to pantyhose and selling things down in Florida to the mafia. I don't know. There's a record label that did pantyhose? Yeah. Don't okay. ask me why these guys, <laughs> these guys were involved in so much stuff. But when I tell you the stories, they, okay. I, I don't know how to say it. They were just involved in anything that made money. You know those type of people? Huh. And uh, the record label was just a side thing. Uh -huh. And but when they, Patty Holes was doing bad, they tried to sell some records. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it was. So I walked in there and I talked to the guy and I said, yeah, I know you. What do you want? I said, well, look, I like to make records for you and this is what I think I can do. Similar to what I did with my band. I sold a good story and he says, Okay, I'll take a chance. He gave me a, a, a few grand, and I went in and recorded this album. Of course, they had no idea on how to promote an album, what to do, where to go, and I said, I'll take care of that end. And there I was again at the forefront of uh, this music business where I promoted that record. I got it played on the radio. That's not, any, uh, that's not an easy thing to do mm -hmm. if you ever tried right. to get a record played on the radio. First of all, you've got to get an appointment, and if you're an artist, they don't want to see you. Right? There's always the risk of payola. Why are you coming up here? Don't you have a person to bring that record up? So you have to go through all those things, which you'll learn later if you're that, that end of the business. Uh, I finally got the record and didn't know that Frankie Clark would play the whole album, which he did. He played the whole album, and I think at that time I sold about 15,000 records. It was unheard of back then. Uh, they were so excited back at the record company, they asked me, look, let's finish the album. And that's when I had them. You know, I was able to ask for the money that I thought I was entitled to, and I got it. 
-hmm. And then I sort of gradually grew there, and I told them that I wanted to start my own production. I wanted to work for the record company, similar to what I'm going to propose to Red Bull. Um, and uh, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, what I'm saying is that he, he finally bit, and uh, I signed that label, and I said, he said, what do you want to call the label? I said, Sal Soul Records. He said, what the hell is that? I said, Sal means salsa. Soul is soul. And the combination of it is something that I'm going to show that's going to grow into something bigger than you've ever known. Mm. He said, what do you mean? He says, it's going to be the South Soul of Motown. It's going to be similar to Motown, but in its own gender. It's going to be South Soul. So he said, OK. After a while, that first um, recording did so well that I did this album with a lot of the great studio musicians in the world, Cornell Dupree, mm -hmm. John Faddis. The Brecker Brothers, we were blood, sweat, and tears. Wow. Uh, we had Richard T. And um, lo and behold, I had Marty Shella, who did Watermelon Man. And I did all these songs for this album. And I had one particular song that a friend of mine, Gil Scott Harris, recorded called The Bottle. And he had sung it. And he had a problem because he didn't have the finances to release the product. And I sort of knew that. And I said, you know, I won't touch the record by trying to imitate or emulate what he did singing, because he did such a terrific job. But I will try to attempt to do it instrumentally. This is another phase of the music business that I learned and I started to get good at. And uh, I had Marty Reed write the arrangements after I showed him what I wanted. And we went into the studio. And as you know. I'm sorry, who was the arranger again? Marty Scheller. OK. Who was responsible for Watermelon Man. Ah, I see. He played with Mongo Santa Maria. OK. Right. OK. So we went into the studio. I believe it was a CBS Studios. And you know, as I said before, normally the rhythm comes, then the brass, and then the strings. Well, everybody showed up at the same time, unheard of. I think it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and I have a bunch of people just like this living room here today. And I said, God, what am I going to do? Everybody's here. And they're looking at me, hey, Joe, what are you doing? We all wait. We got other things to do, you know? And these guys, you know, charged by the hour. And I said, he said, do you want to hit record? I said, yeah. He said, well, let's do this. I said, oh, shit, man. I said, I don't know. I don't even, how, do, how do you attempt to place all those guys and play this music at one time in a session? But somehow the engineer looked at me and says, I can do it. I said, well, go ahead, do it. So he set up everybody. Everybody was there looking at me. And uh, lo and behold, here comes this little white guy walking in. And uh, he was supposed to do the lead on the saxophone. So I said, who the hell is he, Marty? He said, that's the guy I told you about. He said, he could blow his ass off. I said, yeah. So the kid sat over there, he warmed up his horn, and we're ready to start the song. What happened that day has never happened in my life uh, since. A part of history that will always be there. We played that song, and we did one take. After the song was completed, there was a complete silence. Just as we're sitting here, the seats were on fire. The mm. horns were smoking. This kid turned out to be David Sanborn. <laughs> we knew that we had something here in the bottle, which we renamed La Botella. And that first week when we played it on BLS, we sold 80,000 records. I think it went on to be 40 nationally, and the rest was history. Um, he's had a, a fabulous career since then, mm. uh, David Sanborn in jazz. Well, let's, you know? play, let's play it for yeah. him. All right. If you caught it, but as you can see, you, you, you're going through parts of my life where I was able to change, and this is very important with anybody in any type of business. Uh, you can find that sometimes you get outdated, you know, with the music and you don't stay in touch. Uh, I still go out, I listen to the clubs, what the kids are playing, who's dancing. You can see if they're not dancing to it, it'll make no difference. You might like it. I'm the last judge of my own music. And normally, there's always a testing ground, like uh, DJs testing on the, on the crowds when they come into their uh, clubs to, to <laughs> listen to. I do the same. You know, I'll bring in some young kids. If I hear them singing the lick, that particular phrase or, or lyric that I want to hear, I said, then there's a possibility that I can get the world to follow that lick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the interesting things is when you're trying to reinvent yourself here, this is now the mid-70s, right? Okay, you wow. do 
Well, I, You're probably wondering how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> Come tomorrow and I will expose you. He's about 25 right now. <laughs> um, experiencing his 40th anniversary and he's 25. But the, um, the whole way that you switched up in the mid-80s, or mid-70s, excuse me, is, <laughs> is very interesting. Yeah, you to. said that you were listening, uh, you told me yesterday you were listening to a lot of Philadelphia uh, international records, mm -hmm. Gamble and Huff and, right. and that kind of thing. And that when you sat down um, with the folks at Americana, you were saying, mm -hmm. you know, I can be your A&R person, and this is what I would do. I would bring in Cornell Dupree, I would bring uh, in Jimmy Young, I would bring in, you're saying, John Faddis, Richard T., these yeah. folks um, to bring in. And yet you would also add on to it your own uh, kind of flavor. Right, the Latin flavor, which is the conga and the timbales. Mm -hmm. which, you know, had been done before, but nobody coined it. The Temptations were doing it. They used the conga and, and uh, I forget them songs. Message they, to a Black Man yeah, or stuff before, like that. They yeah. were doing uh -huh. that all the time. And yeah. when I noticed that, I said, wow, check that out. There's some Latin there. People are not even really identifying it, mm -hmm. but it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Dennis Coffee, a lot of the guys, you know. Mm -hmm. So, oh, uh, yeah. And I did do that. Uh, Philly sound was very instrumental in South Soul. Mm. Without a doubt, after a while, they eventually used the same guys, mm -hmm. you know, and what they did to embellish it was to bring in Latin percussion. Mm. And then, of course, if you had a good song, that only could help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the sound of disco really is interesting because I think the Latin influence in disco is always kind of right. understated. You got to understand, back then, you got to understand, I'm growing up, I'm getting older, I'm going through different phases, and you got to try to work, right? So. If somebody tells you, this year, there's no work for your band, everybody was doing tracks. So I got out there and got my tracks, traveled to Germany, I went to Italy, everybody, and I was singing disco, mm. right? And I was able to survive, while other groups that still had their bands just stayed dormant. They either broke up, they couldn't follow the disco trend, but well, they didn't want it. That's why a lot of them hated disco. Mm. That's why they, they hated the boogaloo. Mm. You always had haters mm. in every type of music. They hated the twist, mm -hmm. you know? But it's there. It's going to be there. You got to know how to get through that wave of influence and keep going on and hold whatever you have together. Can we play some of the other salsa music that you made? Sure. Yeah? Okay. Sure. Um, this one is one of my favorites. This is um, Latin strut. And we can talk a little bit about the, the history of this afterwards. Yeah, okay. And that was from that first record that you had done for Salso, called Salso. Um, yeah. Yeah. Latin Strut actually was a Diodato song, and it was called Soul Strut, right? But because I was in the Latin market, I changed the name to Latin Strut. Of course, he still had credit. I put his name there and everything, but mm -hmm. that's, that's what that did. And um, it got a resurgence after the UK picked it up on Soul Jazz, and they started playing on their compilations, you know? Mm -hmm. So you never know. I think somebody wrote in England, he says, you know, Joe Batan had no idea what he was doing when he coined the term Sal Sol. And it's true. Hmm. You know, I was a young kid, and I said, yeah, Sal Sol. Never knowing today I would be talking about it 40 years later, <laughs> you know, about my music. So sometimes some of the things that I visualized and felt when I was writing songs, because sometimes I cry. I'm a very romantic person when it comes to my songs. Hmm. And um, I start to think about all the effort and the things that I went through to put that song together. I said, ah, nobody's going to understand. And then here it is 40 years later, and somebody write, writes something about a song that was obscure. He says, look what this guy wrote back then. What the heck was he thinking about? And then you start to see, man, you mean really I'm going to get appreciated? Because nobody said nothing for 40 years. Mm. You know, and here or something, somebody writes something, and, it, and it's, it's worth the wait. Mm. It's worth the wait, you know? Mm. That's wonderful. Um, you were... Always keeping your ear to the ground. Yeah. All the new sounds that were kind of coming out. Um, I wanted to play two more tracks, actually. Okay. Um, first, just play this one, and then there's a little bit of a lead up to the next one that I want to play. But this one's after Shower Funk. And which, yeah, oh, said, okay. Do what? you have a Mike Cloud? Any slow song? I bet you I do. Right. Uh, let's see. The uh, reason why I mentioned that is in my New Cloud. York, uh, I'm notoriously renowned for my ballads. Yeah. You see, but every place else that I go, I never get a chance to sing those romantic songs. I mean, there was a time that people used to ask for my phone book because all the girls would be lining up <laughs> out there for these songs that I used to sing slow. And, uh, 
And nobody ever asks me about the slow. Only New York and California when I do the oldie show. You got to understand that when I play with my band, I have different avenues that I can go. I can play pure Latin all night for you, or I can do uh, Latin soul, or I can do the thing where they do with the groups with harmony, four-part harmony, and the group singing like R&B. You know, and, and uh, sometimes I get called to those shows where I don't bring a band, they have a band already. And we go there and we play with the moments, uh, stair steps, you name it. Uh, what's the band? The jazz band. I mean, all those big groups. Mm -hmm. And it, it's amazing how I'm able to step <clears throat> into different areas and meet different people. Yeah. And I guess that's what's endeared me to a lot of people. But you know, that's, that's actually a really, really important um, point to make because in the dances that you're playing, they don't just want to dance, they want to slow dance too. So I they can hope get, so. They're close to the, <laughs> you know, close to the partner and that kind of thing. How do you know? How do you know? Uh, I don't know. I, I've never experienced any of that kind of stuff. <laughs> But, um, but I found it. I found my cloud. So you hear this? But you know that oh, I'm married, yeah. right? No, I, 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 I can't I've heard. dance with you. Okay. I've heard. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do it on the under on the side <laughs> later. On. Okay. Here's my cloud. Yeah. See the disco ball turning slowly <laughs> in the, the middle of the room. And, yeah. yeah. When well, yeah. we get married. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, so you uh, had taken a big break, actually, between 1975, 1976 or so, and 1980. Um, you well, actually... I made it to 1979. That's you made when it to 1979. Well, yeah, let's talk about that, because mm -hmm. you, you um, also took off. But right. it ended up taking off without you, in a way. Yeah, yeah? well, they left me in the dust once again, and we had our arguments. Uh, I couldn't get along. I think I had some vices. I used to like to gamble. And um, I guess it didn't go hand in hand with what was happening, living the fast life, and this business can be cruel. Um, one day I went to get my check, and there was no check. And I guess they said they didn't need my services anymore, and I didn't have any type of agreement that would have binded them, and I was in the street again. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, having my pride, uh, I would never go back to beg for anything, so I just went about my way, hoping, and if I would have known what I know today, that there was help always for me, uh, it might have been a little easier, but I guess you learn by trial and error. And I went along and I started to raise my family, <coughs> and actually we were involved in karate a lot. Uh, all my kids are black belts, my wife also. I carried the bags for 11 <laughs> years. Uh, actually, what it is, I wanted to join, and. Every time I went to join, one of the family members jumped in front of me. And the last one was my wife. She said, no, I want to do this. Oh, yeah. Finally, I, I ended up carrying the bags. I knew everything about karate. I knew how to speak Japanese, the whole dog on shebang. But uh, people thought I was a grandmaster when we would go to the tournaments. They would always be bowing to me, oh, sensei. Hey. And you know, they wouldn't know that I, I didn't know the first thing about kata. But, uh, <laughs> and it was one of our dreams to get the kids into the Olympics. And uh, we studied Shotokan. And wouldn't you know it, that that year, particularly year after 11 years, when the Olympics came along, it was Taekwondo. So we didn't even qualify. <laughs> so 11 years went down the drain. I get everybody was mad at me. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> but no, before that, before that though, yeah. with, with the Salso thing, yeah, because um, you were. You were, uh, you, you had a quarter, I understand, a quarter oh, yes. of the Salso yes. ownership yes. Um, at one point. And what I, yeah, what had happened was okay. I made an agreement with Salso. I was, I was getting up there with uh, popularity, and I said I wanted to start my own label. And he said, well, what are you thinking of doing? I said, well, I got a name called Salso that I want to incorporate and start. And they said, okay, fine. They would have did whatever I told them to after the success I had with the bottle and everything else that was happening. And uh, when they started to get uh, the notion that there was something uh, advantageous to owning part of this name, they sort of convinced me for a few dollars that they should be partners with me in this label. And of course, it was divided between three brothers, the Carey brothers and Joe Batan. Actually, after that, and I've done this a lot in my life, uh, I'm not proud of it, but um, I always found myself uh, selling whatever I created. And uh, always with the notion in my mind that I could always do it again. That's very dangerous. 
in life. You probably can. But faith might not have it that way. You might possess the talent to do something continuously, but your lifestyle and what you do might not allow you to do it. And that's what I didn't figure on. It's like I have a closet full of Joe Batan records. I gave all my records away to people that come to the house. Hey, can I get one? Yeah, yeah. Never thinking that the closet would be bare today, you know? And I can't even get my own records. I mean, I got people that bring my records to me, uh, collectors and stuff. Hey, Joe, here's a copy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's how I got my collectors. I gave everything away. And there was no difference with the label. Um, when that happened was, I had no idea that it was going to develop into the monster. Yes, I did. But never knowing to the point of financial end. So I didn't follow my dream fully. And I left them. Mm. I said, I'll do it again, and I'll start again. Actually, I did start another label called and Ghetto Records, and that's starting to come out now. <laughs> but the flip side of it is that you ended up working with young people again. Yes. In yes. Harlem. And yeah. Yeah, in the I, late 70s, you started hearing new stuff. Yeah. I worked in a community center in Harlem, right in the midst of 110th Street. It was called like Hell's Kitchen. I mean, it was really hell there. I mean, everything sat down on the stoop outside that center. And, you know, you'd sweep the center in the morning, and, and you'd have to sweep the people away, too, because everybody hung out there from hangovers from the night before or shootings or what you might expect in a neighborhood like a melting pot like that. And uh, one day, while opening up the community center, somebody wanted to rent the place, a bunch of young kids. And that night, I stood at the door. We were collecting the money, and all these young kids started coming in. And I saw this guy setting up some turntables. This is 1978, 79. And then I looked, and the next thing I looked, there was like 10 people on the dance floor, and then the place was packed. Hmm. And I said to myself, what the hell is going on here today? I don't see a band. Who's singing? And they said, oh, something that they do. They had no name for it. We didn't know what the hell they were doing. Oh, I just saw them kids like, shh, shh, and the feet was shuffling on that floor, and it was a sound that you knew something was really going to transpire, and then they would get into the middle of a record, and they would start, and they were clapping, they were, so what's that? and the guy was just talking on the mic, I said, what the hell is that shit, <laughs> and then I said, how much are these kids paying to get in, he said, everybody's paying a dollar, there was a thousand kids in there, and then I said, let me see if this is just a fad, or maybe something that I don't know, and then they said, they do this all the time, I said, they do it all the time, I said, is this on records? He said, no, what's that? It's not on records. And then I had a brainstorm. I said, whoa, this is not on records. Whoa, we got to get this thing. So I'm not being uh, the creator of rap, but having seen that, I had the good um, idea that, let me try to talk to these guys. The guys were Jekyll and Hyde. One became a CEO at Motown, I believe. A guy named Andre Harrell. Right, right. Yeah, you know more. good. And... Um, I spoke to them and I said, look, how you guys would like to put that on records? You know, what you're doing, or they're talking stuff. And he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess they didn't believe who I was. They didn't care. I hadn't done anything for a while, so they said, hey, he's full of shit. Maybe he's just trying to con us. I went out and borrowed some money, got RCA Studios, had everything ready. And at that time, they weren't thinking about using musicians for rap songs. And I got these four guys. I, I would put down the music and had everything done. There was a young lady by the name of Jocelyn Shaw who all you might know is Jocelyn Brown. She lives in the UK now, <laughs> and tremendous singer. I mean, Gordon Edwards told me, Joe, you want a girl that sings like I play the bass? I said, yeah, who? He brought her, just another uh, Dave Sanborn, and she sang her ass off. She sang on Sadie on one of my records. And um, she did the background. We doubled it, and the result was, when you start feeling those chills, you know you have something, clap your hands, everybody. everybody. And I said, whoa, what do we got here? Then I waited and I waited three hours. Nobody showed up to the studio. Jekyll and Hyde were supposed to come in and record the rap. Did, they didn't show up. Andre Harrell didn't show up. None of them. Because they thought I was, you know, bullshitting them or what. Here I spent all this money and I was going to pay these guys. How was I going to pay the studio? It was RCA, you know, lucky I had a little line of credit. So I thought about it and I thought about Jocko Henderson. If you don't know, he was a DJ back in the 50s. A radio DJ. A radio DJ. Mm -hmm. And he used to talk on the mic. Mm -hmm. uh, like similar to Frankie Crocker. And he would say smart things like, ooh, Papa, do, how do you do, and stuff like that, you know? And I said to myself, you know what? 
I think I could do this myself. <laughs> and and I, and I started to test silently in the back. I didn't want anybody to see because I said, maybe I'm too old to do this. I think I was about 39 years old. You know, I said, hey, that's a 39 year old rapper, right? So I was hiding. I was hiding in the toilet and I was saying, here's a little thing. I'm going to make you. I said, no, don't go like that. I said, better do it on the second beat. And I tried all kinds of methods. And then when the music was playing, I sort of walked through it. It was just like made to order. And when I got out there, because I was really gun shy, you know, having not done this before, mm -hmm. what people would say, especially the young kids that were there. And when the girl started clapping, she started waving her hand, and on two, and I said, oh shit, let me try that, <laughs> you know? And, and then when I did the song, I said, it's a new thing out, and boom, it was history. Mm -hmm. uh, I did that record, and then I shopped it around. I went to all the record companies. They threw me out. Get the hell out of here, Joe. You don't sing anymore? I said, this is something new. You got to listen to this. Get the hell out of here with that shit. Don't bring that <laughs> junk in here. And, and then I went to some guys named Luigi at Prelude, I believe. And there was a young kid in the back. And Luigi says, OK, what do you got here? I said, well, I want you to play something new. He said, yeah. He said, wait a minute. I got to call this guy. You don't mind. He listens to everything that we do. And we sort of listen to him. I said, I don't want no young kid come here and tell me about my music. He said, well, then it's not going to happen because we all listen to him. The guy turned out to be Larry Levon, right, from the garage, <laughs> if everybody knows. There was nobody like Larry, as far as the DJ is concerned, to this day. And Larry came out, and he played the record. And he started jumping up in the air, and he was going like this. And I'm saying, holy shit. And he's smiling at me, and I said, wait a minute, maybe this might be good for me. And the guy said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, what do you want? I said, well, I want an advance. He said, we don't give advance. I said, goodbye. And I walked out. Mm. Larry kept following me down the stairs. Don't go, don't go, don't go. <laughs> he said, bring it to my club. Let me play in the club. I said, no, f excuse my language. I said, fuck them guys, man. They don't know about my music. I'm trying to show them something new. And they didn't even got the insight to see it. Hell with them. They don't want to pay no money. So I kept going. And I met a girl by the name of Denise. And she happened to be with Sal Soul, going out with one of the brothers. And I was still in touch, even though I wasn't with Sal Soul anymore. And she said, you got to let Kenny hear this. She heard the record. She was raving about it. This is something great. And I said, no, you know me and Kenny don't get along. She says, look, I'll talk to him. I told him that you got something great. And the words started filtering around the industry. Joe Batan has something once again. Mm. And one DJ uh, summed it up. He says, you know, this guy keeps coming around every two, three years with something new. And we got to listen because he's always bringing us something. So Kenny, I played the record for him. He said, what do you want? I said, I want to release this. I'll put it out tomorrow. I said, what? I didn't know that they had a distribution deal with RCA, so he could do that. Mm. He said, I don't have no money. And I had to take a deep breath and say <clears> to myself, look, I'm going to end up losing this because everybody's going to get whimmed at this new stuff. Everybody's going to be doing it soon. Mm -hmm. Rap, uh, Sugar Hill Gang already beat me out. Fatback Man beat me out. Actually, Sugar Hill came out afterwards. Though, no, it? it came out first. Yeah, yeah okay. it looks like that because I had the big hit in Europe. Mm -hmm. And we were follow. we were playing back and back of each other mm -hmm. all throughout the Europe. But they had it on in New York first, but New York wouldn't play me, you know? They didn't, like, they didn't want any rap. Rap was like uh, taboo, mm -hmm. right, at that time. And finally he said, okay, and I agreed. The only uh, brainstorm that I had is that when I signed a contract, I put a small notation in the bottom that he, didn't, he, he forgot to read. And I finally got back at them. Mm. Uh, after everything was dead tight, I put in there, I said, this record is only released for domestic purposes. Mm. If uh, it's time to be played internationally, they must seek my permission. And I had them. Mm. They went along. The record started selling like hotcakes. Larry Levant played that in his club. He sold 20 records, 20,000 records the first week from a disco, not a radio, mm -hmm. a disco club. People, it was unheard of. People didn't know that discos could sell records. Mm -hmm. So this was a novelty back then. We all know it now, you know, but at that time, what kind of club could generate that kind of sales? And that was Larry Levan and the Garage. So he went on. He released the record, and of course, RCA is a big chain. They had no idea what they had. They sent the record around the world. And all of a sudden, Glenn LaRusso, who's still with them, called me up. He says, Joe, they want you to come to Holland. I said, Holland? For what? <laughs> he said, they said that record is a hit. I said, how the hell could the record be a hit? It's only been there a week. 
He says, they know. I'm telling you how this business is. He says, when Holland says something, so goes Europe at that time. I said, come on, a little country, what the hell do they know? He says, Joe, they want you to fly over. I said, get out of here. For what? He said, to do TV. <laughs> I got a home. I went. I had no money. All right? I was struggling. I had no job. I had lost my paycheck for South Soul. So I went down and I bought me a black T-shirt similar to this, and I put a disco model of a girl dancing disco on roller skates. <laughs> cost me three dollars <laughs> and then <laughs> I got a little gold star which cost me 50 cents a diamond fake diamond and I pasted on a dollar fifty pair of red suspenders and I put those suspenders on Whoa. and I went to Holland <laughs> and I was ready to go on TV and they said Joe Batan, Joe Batan next and I went and I was ready to go on stage and what I realized, I forgot my shoes <laughs> in the hotel room. And I said, no, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. And I looked around, and, and, and I said, what do you do? And all the kids were jumping up there. They're waiting for Joe Batan, you know, because all of a sudden, this record is a novelty, because they never heard rap in Harlem, right? It was something new. And I found these green pair of track, old track shoes. <laughs> I put them on, and I went on stage. It became the rage of Europe. <laughs> this outfit, I found kids all over Europe imitating that dress code. And everywhere I went, they said, rap of the clap, rap of the clap. And everybody, I was signing autographs from every country, from Luxembourg to Spain to France. I mean, Belgium was number one. Holland was number two. France was number three. And the sorry part of it is that I told somebody the other day, I said, you know what? I've been trying to get to the UK for 40 years, 40 years. And for some reason, they keep keeping me out of there. And the guy, everybody from the UK says, what are you talking about, Joe? You know, we know your music dance. So let me tell you the story. Rapple Clapo was selling in the millions. I never got home. When I went to Holland, I stayed in Europe for six months, going from country to country, selling records. No pay, but never knowing the money that I was generating. Because you see, in Europe, as opposed to America, the residuals are seven times mm. that which you would make in the States, mm. especially if you own the publishing. Mm. They will literally kiss your ass if you own publishing to a big record. You could retire. I've lived off of Rapper Clapper for 10 years, mm. still living off it. It's the <laughs> biggest record that I've ever made, and it's one of the records that I'm not known for. Mm. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Rapper Clapper was going on, and then here it was in the UK, who really could have put us over the map. <laughs> they were playing the record, of course, the DJs. They don't want to hear nothing. If something that they like, they're going to play. But to get it played on the air, I had difficulty because I didn't know the politics at that time. And someone in England, I don't know who it was, got word back, if he gives up half of the publishing, we will play his song. Of course, you know what daddy told him, shove it. The record was never played to the full potential that it could have. So mm -hmm. Joe Batan could have been a household name by now. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you see, all through my life, I kept missing. Mm -hmm. I kept missing everywhere I went. I was second to this. When I threw the concert in Shea Stadium, I was second to that. They just happened to go to the moon that day, and the whole stadium was rained on, mm. you know, when they went to the moon. Um, so here it is. Forty years later, I'm set to go to the UK. I'm going to go to the, what's it, uh, the jazz, uh, what's the name of that club in England? Jazz Cafe. Jazz Cafe. So they got me settled. It's on the internet. Everybody said, Joe Batan's coming. And uh, I'm sorry to say, they wouldn't pay me the money that I requested. Not a lot of money. Nothing in the Madonna scale. None of the guys. It was very cheap, I'm sorry to say. And Joe Batan didn't go. Once again, I told him, I said, let me tell you something. I'm not going to the UK to whore myself to satisfy you because you're going to sell a few tickets and you're going to make uh, uh, some money on me coming there. I said, I'll wait. I said, because eventually I will be in the UK. And when I thought about coming to Australia, I know my next step is the UK. Uh, with God's blessing, tomorrow when you come there, we're going to make history. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do come, you will see what I'm talking about. And uh, eventually I will get to the UK. And those purists over there will tell me, kiss my ass. And I'm finally going to play the music that I've wanted to play for those people over there that do love my music. And um, that's just a little part that's of that beautiful. story. That's beautiful. <laughs> so
So, Joe, why don't we, why don't we uh, play uh, Rappel Clapel here and then maybe yeah. take questions from the audience? Sure. Um, one thing I did want to say is that you did come back and make an album in 2005 yeah, with Vampiso. Great, <laughs> great records called Call My Name. Yeah. Uh, actually, do you want to talk about that real quick sure. before we play Rappel Clapel? Okay, then we can let me, let me just honest. get back a little. Okay. Eight years ago, Joe Batan died. I literally physically died. Let me tell you what happened. I was working my job. I'm a tour commander at a prison. So you see how funny life is? The same place that I was locked up as a kid, I'm in charge of running now. Hmm. So what I do is I give back to the kids that, that get into trouble and I tell them my story. And it sort of gives them a feeling that there's a possibility that they could get out of the rut that they're in, similar to what I did. Um, I've been doing that for 25 years. I'm getting ready to retire next year. Um, I was there and I work at the night shift. And I started to hold my head. You know, you know your body, when something changes, I started twitching, got a little twitch in my head. I said, what the hell is this, man? And I guess it was tension. I went down to the, to the infirmary, and I told the guy, hey, you know, take my pressure. What's going on? My head is shaking. He said, whoa, Joe, your pressure's 190 over 110. He says, you know what you do? I don't know if those good advice. Go upstairs, turn the lights out, and start rubbing your neck. Mm. The guys, when I told them, they started laughing. <coughs> what kind of damn uh, uh, diagnosis is that? You better go to the damn hospital. You know, I didn't listen, so you know, you know how you are when you first start taking medicine. I was taking medicine for blood pressure. Um, and I sat back, turned the lights out, and started rubbing my head, my neck. Got up and I made it through the morning. Just got paid. I carry a bag all the time, you know, so I won't lose things. And it's like my life, everything is in that little bag. You know, right now it's in my hotel room. I got my wife guarding it. But anyway. <laughs> I told, called my wife up and I said, let's go see Star Wars. And just like a kid, I said, I want to be one of the first in the neighborhood to see the movie so I could tell everybody about it. And she said, oh, come on. I said, they had a new theater, we went. Here we go to Star Wars. I started buying my popcorn, eating my Franks, all the salt, soda, <laughs> lemonade, everything. When I got out of the, the movie, you got to understand it's early in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning. I got in the movie at 9. It's about 11 o'clock now. I approached the car, went into the car and started it up, and I grabbed the wheel, and then I rolled the window down. I reached back into my back seat to see if my bag was there, because I had my pay, I just got paid. Everything was intact, except that I started bleeding out of my mouth. Mm. Now, you know you might bleed sometimes, but this blood was different. It was flowing. It was flowing in abundance, and I started to go. I started to get dizzy, and everything started to get blurred. And when I started to spit out the blood out the window, I reached back. It shows you how life is. You love material things, right? And I started to reach for the bag. Here I'm about to die, cloak the bucket, and I'm looking back for my paycheck. <laughs> I got back into some sort of senses, and my wife was having a conversation with my daughter, and I started choking her literally choking and she didn't know what the hell was going on and I was and when I analyze it now because I don't know what the hell I was doing I was mad at her because she didn't know what I was going through mm. that I was about to die that's how it happens mm -hmm. you know you start to go mm -hmm. and I had no control over it if it ever happens to you you'll know what I mean I started choking her and she jumped out the car to get help I got out of the car and I started banging the the the, the hood Boom, boom, the security guard, I punched him. Took 12 people to restrain me. Hmm. What, the rest is what I've been told. I woke up in a hospital 10 hours later unconscious. What are the chances of your whole family being called to your bedside? Because while I was in, in the bed in a coma, I had one of those tubes that they put down to you for breathing. My wife, my daughters, my family, the grandkids were all around the bed. And this is what I like to say happened. And I, I do use this in my testimony when I play, every time I perform. A hand reached down while I was drowning in my subconscious. And it reached out to me and said, Joe, you keep running away from me. He says, I gave you so much talent, you have not done anything with it. You haven't helped anybody. He said, I want you to stop running away from me and do my work. 
And that hand pulled me back up into life. And I started to open my eyes and I saw my family there and I, and I couldn't talk. If you ever get on that bed, you better pray for a pencil and a piece of paper so you could tell them, get the damn tube out of my throat, I can't talk, <laughs> right? They're really gonna kill me now. <laughs> and somehow my daughter said, he's trying to say something, he's trying to say something, and I wrote, get the tube out of my throat. They finally got it out, and I said, Shh, what the hell's going on here? Why is everybody here? Everybody kept quiet, they didn't want to tell me. They were ready to give me my last rights. Mm. I was gone, they said I had a brain tumor. I mean, I don't know, to this day, I don't know. I, keep, I got the shirt with all the blood in my car, in, in my trunk. I keep it there to remind me if I ever get too big for my britches and not knowing what the real meaning of life is and that I'm here on borrowed time to do something and that I'm secondary, I'm nobody. Right? The Lord is my, my master. He's teaching me, he's guiding me. He allowed me to come here to Australia to talk to you. And if you have someone that you love and that you haven't told recently, call that person up and say, I love you. If it's your grandma, your little kid, even your little dog, tell them you love them. You know why? Nothing's promised. We don't have to be here tomorrow. As you know, the tragedies that you've had here in Australia and different places. You can be here today, we can walk outside tomorrow and we're gone. So I've been dedicated that regardless of what I do with my music, that I will mention his name and try to let people know about the goodness in life and what we can do together to build a world that's free and peaceful. Mm. And uh, I just thank God that I'm here once again mm. and being able to sing to you. Thank you, Joe. Thank some you. music, some questions afterwards? Sure. I'm okay, ready. so sure. let's let's uh let's play some rabble clapple. How's that? <laughs> okay, this is your time now to uh, ask Mr. Joe Baton any questions you might have. Uh we have the mic up here. Oh, hold on, hold on. Oh Do you want me to play? <laughs> uh, play yeah. see. Uh, oh, sitting down so long. Woo. Let's see. Uh, actually, what I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you something. You got to understand, I had no musical training. And um, most everything I did was on the seat of my pants or what I saw the people do. I was very good at watching people and imitating people. Uh, the first three chords that I ever learned was this. C, D minor, E minor. And I was able to find out a little secret about myself because I didn't have all the other tools to work. So what do you do? I loved the piano. But we couldn't afford a piano when I was a kid. And um, I could afford music lessons. And I knew how to sing, but mostly by ear. And when I learned those three chords, I wrote my first song. And when people started to come into the audience to listen to what I was doing, I said, wow, there might be a possibility. I have something here. Uh, what I recommend is anybody that writes, please learn, learn an instrument, especially the <coughs> piano, if you're writing. It only helps you. And I guess it took me into another direction because I was handicapped by the few chords that I knew. So I had to embellish upon it and, and do things that were not conventional that other people do. Now, you know, when you write a song, you always have A, A, then you have the bridge with B, and then it reverts back to A. So I try to devise ways where I might start with B. I would start a song with the bridge. And when I learned about modulation and I found that a lot of people weren't using it, I had to find out how to do that on the piano so that I would go into another key because I knew it brought life. And when I finally found out about the difference between minor and major, about being sad and happy, that brought another element into my writing. Uh, I'm still learning. Uh, after a while, I got so good at it that I was able to take shortcuts. There was a time in my life where I was put, not destitute, but I was broke. <laughs> and um, I didn't have a piano. So and I still had to write, and the guy had contracted me to do an album. So what the hell, how do you write an album if you don't have an instrument? And God bless me, because what I did was, is I put on the radio. I actually literally listened to the radio and all the songs that were played and I took excerpts from songs, mentally, from the radio, 
and placed them in my mind chronologically and wrote the song embedded in my mind. Finally, when the piano came along, I was able to translate that into the music. Uh, the first way I learned how to sing is that I read a newspaper. <laughs> and this is great training. I don't know if anybody does that. Um, if you notice in some of my songs, I might say too many words. I had a habit of saying too many words in a song. <laughs> when I could have just said, I love you, I said, hey, baby, I love you. And I put all these other words in there, right? <laughs> so it, it takes training to do that. But I didn't know that I was developing a style. So what I did was I would read a newspaper. And I said, let me challenge myself. Uh, whatever's written on that paper, let me sing it. And I would read uh, maybe the history. There was a, probably a war or some uprising somewhere, and I would sing about that, and I would play these three chords, you know? There's an uprising in Russia, and I don't really know what to do. <laughs> but darling, you know that I love you so. And I would do things like that, and then I said, well, gee, what do I do? I got to say, play the same song. So I would change it around. I would play it fast. Can't you feel it when we talk? Can't you feel it? And then I started to get into the cha-cha vein. And what I was able to do with songs was change the rhythm. And I found out it was another style that I did. Whatever I did slow, I could do fast. And that became a style of mine. So one particular song of mine, which I wrote recently, maybe in the 90s, was The Good Old Days. And actually, we rode into the car before we had the piano. Uh, and we had no idea how it was going to sound. I just knew that the chord had to bounce back somewhere. And uh, I open it up in my show sometime, and it goes something like this. We <laughs> I really enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so as you can see, that was a growing up experience, and I wanted to share with that. If you come tomorrow, you will see how a lot of the songs are incorporated that way. Uh, I'm just so blessed by the Lord. Uh, and finally realizing it in my old age is what making me enjoy this business so much more. You have no idea that you could really become alive again. See, there's no reason for me to be here. I'm 64 years old, and I feel like a kid. I do all the things that the kids do, all the things that you do. Try to do my exercise and best of what I could do, ride my bike, I play ball, I got a hell of a jump shot. <laughs> and I do these things, and, uh, and now I got the opportunity to play my music, which I love so much. This is not an accident. I'm here because he sent me. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you had a question? Hi um, yeah, so, so yeah, you're amazing, really. Nice. Thank you. Um, just wondering if you ever like go and like buy some of your music to like film and ask us to this, and um, if you could educate us on the business side of things and all sure. things. Sure. Okay. The first thing, there's a book called This Bu Business of Music, Get It, by Clyde Davis. I think they have several editions since then. He goes through the spectrum of things that you're supposed to know as far as your publishing, contracts, signings, when you need to get an attorney all those things that you do know. The merchandising part of it is also mentioned there. I know that book was what guided me, and that was some time ago, so I know that it's probably better editions now, but you do need to read up on the business that you're going to get involved in, whether it's film or whatever. I recently did uh, a little part in, um, what's the name of this song? Liberty Kid, that's going to be released. Uh, they're they're going to use some of my music, from what I gather. And uh, I guess we got to go through the ropes. There's a law called the uh, rear view window law. If I can put it into effect, I, all the product, all the songs that Joe Batan ever did are going to come back to me. As far as I'm concerned, I'm a rebel. All those songs belong to me. Come and get me. Mm. All right? I re-release them if I have to. 
uh, you say, well, you can't do that. What do you mean I can't? Take me to court. Then I'll get you for copyright infringement. Mm. How have you used? You know that after a 28-year period, you're supposed to put in uh, your agreement with uh, the copyright office so that those songs will come back to you. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't. But also in my contract, there's a clause for, for hire. If that's in there, then that's all they had. They don't really own me. You see, so all that stuff belongs to me. So they're not going to fight me. They're not going to come looking for Joe Batan, you know? But I got to look at it spiritually also, you know, I'm blessed. Most of the guys that did what I'm doing are not here anymore. I'm still here to carry on the legacy and to teach people about what happened to us, you know? And uh, before me, there were others, you know, that this happened, they really broke. They, before them, there were others then. I think it's only until recently that a lot of the artists are getting paid, and believe it, it's a lot of the rap artists, a lot of the people that are singing up there today, they're getting paid, you know? Either they're gonna blow up the studio, but they're, gonna get paid. they're getting paid. So it's not like uh, when we, and I'm getting paid. Uh, I, I've done a lot of deals, I mean, I hope I get paid, but I, I, I'm getting paid. Uh, people are not doing what they did many years ago. You find that most of the big companies don't have time to cheat you. Because if they have to go public, they have to answer to a lot of people, so you're better off with a large company, I would say, unless you're independently trying to get into a company that you control yourself. Open up a publishing company. The first thing you should do, it's not that difficult. Find out how. Copyright your songs, your ideas. Mail it to yourself. Don't open up the envelope. It's legal. Uh, get an attorney. Get on the internet. You, I never had an internet to find out information. You have a world at your feet. There's no reason for anybody to be ignorant mm -hmm. uh, about the music business. Uh, the hustle part, well, that has to be learned on your own. If you have the gumption, you got to keep yourself in shape. So if I believe if you have these three ingredients, you'll meet success. That spirit, you must believe in something that's going to guide you. You must take care of your body, your health every day so that you'll have the energy to do what you want to do and knowledge. Do not let one day go by that you do not learn a new word or a new something. Do not waste your time idly with not learning something every day. It's only going to enhance the other two and they work together to hopefully uh, let you get you what you want to achieve. Yes? The microphone. Joe, you said that your kids uh, were experts in karate. I didn't say they were experts. I said they took it. <laughs> it's a different. I try to be humble now. <laughs> Did you ever uh, teach them music that they ever express any interest in learning? It's like, like anything else, and you'll find it. Are you a parent? No. Okay, you don't have any kids. Let me tell you. Take your time before you get married. <laughs> Make sure you know what you're doing and what you're getting into. Because you see, we have too many kids raising kids. You see? So you've got to know that there's a responsibility. All right? You got to take care of them kids. Now, kids don't always follow what their parents do. My kids were no different. They had all the tools there for them to, to follow in a, a line of music. But my first thing was physical with them, that they had to learn how to walk up the stairs. I didn't want any lazy kids in my house. Uh, we ran track when they were three years old. Mm. They were doing cross-country running. Mm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, or we leave you behind. You know? <laughs> but let me tell you why. I got old girls in my family. I got one boy, mm. and for a long time, him and I sat on the couch every time my wife went to the hospital to have a, a child, and we would wait to see what was coming. And when we heard it was a girl, he said, not again. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing has changed. Now, these kids have had kids, and there's two girls. <laughs> <laughs> and we see not again, but you know what? It's a blessing. They say the girls don't leave you. The girls don't leave you. And uh, I'm going to start a singing group. I'm going to make them play a band. <laughs> Those girls can do everything a boy can do. And they're not tomboys. Uh, they took up karate because they had to defend themselves. I knew that my son was going to have a hard time. And he said, Dad, I can't keep running out there defending them. They're always getting into some argument. So I had the girls learn. And it turned out to be pretty good. You know, some of them. You know? And uh, we studied Shotokan, and they can take care of themselves. I mean, you got to be very careful with, with the martial arts. They got to learn to know what it's really about, that it's open hand, it's only for defense when you need it, 
You're not supposed to go around using it. You're not supposed to boast about it. You're not even supposed to talk about it. You know, that's something that's instilled in the way of life. And all it do is it's supposed to help you with the other things that you want to do. Unfortunately, that didn't happen to my family because some of them were soul losers. You know, and they didn't want to lose. They were coming second. They didn't want to lose. We had to get out of it. Yes? Hi. At some point in your life, you were able to see that rap was going to be like the, the future of music, like the new thing coming. So what do you think is going to be like the, the new thing in music nowadays? Okay. Well, look, you know, I grew up through a lot of phases, you know, from, from, from rock and roll. Before that, it was rhythm and blues. Uh, actually, my first love of music was show tunes, the Gershman's, Cole Porter, mm. things like that. That's how I grew up. Uh, and he gets your gun, carousel, stuff like that. I love, especially Rhapsody and Blues, my favorite. Mm. Uh, and then I saw these changes. I saw the twist come. I saw Chubby Checker get that from Hank Ballard. And I saw that craze come. I saw Elvis Presley come through. I saw Frankie Lyman with rock and roll. Then I saw the disco era come through. And then when the rap era came through, uh, reggaeton was happening. All right? Uh, how long that would last, I don't know. Uh, I've always been on the forefront of bringing something back, which I've been trying to do for 40 years. I haven't been successful. And what I want to do is I want to bring back the square dance. Uh, <laughs> but I want to bring it back hip. <laughs> so hep, and I have to get somebody to help me put it together because I got to have the right exact music. I'm thinking about R. Kelly. He might be the right guy. Uh, I, think I, I think I made some notes because he's really a genius. I listen to the stuff that this guy does. And um, I believe when he did that record, Step, Step, mm. this is what I see with the square dance. With the square dance, we will de definitely do do si do grab your partner. And I see all these people having fun on the dance floor. <laughs> Right? But it'll be done hep. It won't be like, get your partner. Rah, 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 rah. No, it'll be like, oh, get your partner. Let's do it. And it'll be hep. So that might be the next wave of music. <laughs> yes. Oh, she wants the mic. Okay. Hello. Uh, uh, actually, thanks, uh, first of all, for the music. And when you mentioned, it's also a record label. I was so happy because uh, Nancy Nasty uh, by Soso Orchestra is one of my favorite okay. recipes that I'm having. So, and actually, my question is uh, how, how is it related the Soso Orchestra, 50 Pieces Band, to your record label? Because it was called like in 1974, I don't understand. Well, let me tell you. South Soul was in existence when there was nobody there. I was the only one there on the label, there was no artist. They were dealing in Mexican music, uh, garacha, and songs like that that they were importing and selling cutouts, right? When I introduced the word South Soul as a company, my first album was called South Soul. The concept was to bring together and merge Latin and soul, all right? Later on, when I had my arguments with South Soul, and they felt that they, 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 they picked my brain for everything that I had gave them. I showed them the Philly sound. I showed them Jimmy Young. They actually got some of these mus musicians to come down from Philly to play for South Soul. The end result was a Vince Montana that came down. He wrote a lot of those songs. He became the leader of the South Soul Orchestra, right? But he did not start South Soul Records. The whole concept, the whole idea was mine, right? He was very successful. So were a lot of the other artists. So was Ken Carey, all right? And they did this in the absence of me when they actually booted me out of the, of the company. Hmm? Next question is, uh, how is it, uh, how it was? Like you actually uh, were working with Joseph Brown with the uh, electric phone maybe. And how is it uh, to have uh, those um, singers that was uh, related to most uh, important disco uh, hits in that era. And did you have a meet, for example, Patrick Adams or oh. producers like that? And how did you like? Did you have a meet to some Yeah, I don't remember all the names. Patrick was a good friend. He was a very talented guy. He was always in the studios at the forefront of bringing a lot of those acts. You got to understand, Ken Carey, at that time, let everybody come up to the studio. You got to understand, South Soul was like Motown. Everybody and their mother wanted to be a part of South Soul. So everybody came up there. So there's no way 
in hell that you're not going to see everybody. Every DJ in the country was calling South Soul. Every producer, from Tom Moulton to Patrick Adams, but they all went up there and they all brought their products, and some of it got paid and some of they used, some of them made a few dollars, and all right, but the essence was they didn't start it. See, they came in after to be a part of the South Soul family. That's the only inkling that I have with the South Soul record label, that it was my concept, my idea, and my name, right? Patrick Adams, all those guys, I've worked with them, and they're very talented. Uh, you got, uh, what's his name? Uh, Patrick, uh, you had, uh, oh boy, I forget all these names, all these groups. BT Express, the guy that did with him, and uh, all those guys, they had different labels, and they had made different deals with different record companies at that time. Disco was a wide open market. So if you look at those records, you will notice that most of those records were played by the same guys, right? Like Bernard and those guys, they were the hit makers during that era, S similar to Motown, that group that played all those hit records, they never got credit, mm -hmm. right? Until recently when they made the movie that you knew that these guys played in all those big hit records for all those R&B artists. The same thing holds true for disco, the Babbitts, the Messios, all those guys and the Cornell Dupree's, the Gordon Edwards, they all played on those songs, but of course they were in the background, they were making money as sidemen, mm -hmm. you know? But they weren't in the forefront of their own records until so guys like Bernard, they did Chic and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, Gil Scott Heron, I, I, I believe he, he's in the in, uh, UK, right, with Brian. They had that hit record, The Bottle, in New York, and it was on a label, I forget the label. Strata. A Strata, right? Strata. Yeah. yeah. And it was an independent label, I think something from Harlem, and they ran into financial trouble. One of the, hit, <laughs> the biggest disco record at that time. And when they were playing it, they didn't have the money, as you know, if you don't know, you can go broke with a hit record. All right, let me explain. It takes eight weeks to break a record. Now, if you want to have any kind of luck, you got to get this record played all over the country at one time. And there's very few people that can do that. RCA, Sony, but a little label like South Soul back at that time, or they, they couldn't do it until they got bigger. Right, you might get a record. They're not going to do it. They don't have the manpower. They don't have the money to put that record, just to produce that record, you know how many idea, how many, how many records you would have to make? Mm -hmm. And suppose you don't get it played, you gotta eat the records. Then you go broke. That's why you got all these record stores going bankrupt. I believe somebody just went bankrupt Tower. now. Tower, Tower Records. records yeah. I'm probably not gonna get paid, I had some records in there, mm -hmm. right? But they knew what they were gonna do. They started selling everything in cutouts, they started selling it for a dollar. Mm -hmm. You watch any of these record stores where they start selling things for a dollar, so they're getting ready to, Filed chapter 11. So there's no difference in the industry. Uh, they had to put out this record, they had no more money, and they sold about 50,000 albums. Great. So when it came time, the stores were demanding more records, they had the money, no more money. That means the record was going to die and they were going to go broke. You see? So, and that can happen to a lot of people. So you have to be on time. You got to know exactly your market. For instance, if I came to Australia, and I wanted to play a record, and I wanted to make sure that everybody bought it, I would have to have a nucleus, what would be a nucleus that everybody would enjoy before I take a chance, right? I wouldn't bring here a merengue song thinking that everybody was gonna buy it if they didn't understand it. So that's where you can go broke. So you should be the last one to um, uh, praise your, your, your work. You should always ask others outside interests so that you know that you're getting some sort of a help. So Joe, you, you, did you actually bring in Gil Scott Heron and Brian Jackson then when you were doing your cover of The Bottle? No. No, you no, didn't? no. Okay. He was, he was gone. Okay. Uh, I just happened to, I met him later. Uh -huh. He was so happy and proud that I, well, what I did to his song, he still mentions it. He mentioned it in his last documentary I hear. He calls me the mayor of New York. Hmm. Uh, hopefully I'll meet the guys when I go get to the UK. <laughs> Yes. Do another question. Oh, back this way. Um, uh, were you ever involved with the, uh, the freestyle? 
I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Freestyle, you know. Oh. The freestyle sound. Yes, well, I did Shaft. And it might not be a record that was recognized at that time, but there was a Francis who played at the sanctuary. And that was one of the, uh, the discotheques over a cemetery oh. that we used to go to. The first time I went there, Francis, I went. Francis Grasso? Grasso? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he was one of the first DJs to play Joe Batan. Mm. And Latin artists weren't even thinking about bringing their records to DJs. And I had found a gold mine when uh, I was allowed to come into the club, you know? And I went up to him, they, they introduced me, and he, he listened to the record and he played it. And then I was finding out a source of energy and sale markability that no one else knew in New York. And that was the disco. I was on the forefront of the club scene uh, before most artists or the promoters, right? Because they didn't recognize, they didn't know that what could be generated out of a club. And Francis played that shaft, and I'm telling you, he played the hell out of it so much that I was selling records before it was even played on the radio. They forced the radio to play my songs. Mm. He was one of the first, and of course, then there was Larry Levant. So, but during the 80s, when, you, when they had the freestyle sound, like No Sarah or Noel or mm -hmm. you know, those groups, Expose, different groups, did you do any work at that time, or was that more of a Miami type of thing? Well, I did work, you know, a little, you know, traveling Europe, you know, doing yeah. tracks, you know what I mean, with Rap or Clap or okay. things like that, yeah. Okay. But, That's it. Not, but by no. the mid 80s, and that no, kind of thing, no. you weren't really in. I wasn't done. I was like anymore. sort okay. of in a self inducing retirement. Uh huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Comments? Thoughts? I guess everybody wants to save their energy for tomorrow. Yeah. I think <laughs> so. Well, ladies and gentlemen, oh, right here. Yeah. Narco. Cool. Okay. That might go okay. Um, uh, I suppose uh, you started singing the song called uh, Young Leaf the Tim Brown after that episode about the coma. No. That, that was done in 1969. And that story was actually about me. Uh, when I started, when I write my songs, I used to challenge myself. Uh, as, as you will notice, if you look into my song, I rarely mention the word love because I tried to describe emotion and love with other words, right? I didn't want to, I wanted to be known for something that was different than everybody, every other artist because I know I didn't have the great voice, so I had to bring something else to the table that I would be remembered by. So I tried to adapt my songs so nobody could copy them. You know, I would take it someplace else, or I would use a lot of words uh, where it wasn't natural and uh, that was my only protection beside a copyright of anybody trying to steal my songs or something. And then it developed into a style, you know. But Young Gifted and Brown, as it starts, as you can see, and then you can tell my age. On a rainy Sunday morning in 1942, my mother was blessed with a son who grew up to the Young Gifted and Brown. Okay. <laughs> because you mentioned in that song that you have the chance to change the world around. And that's why Look how funny. I mean, that's how life is. When I wrote that, a guy told me about my cloud. He said, Joe, you were preaching back then. You didn't even know it. I said, what do you mean? He said, listen to the words of my cloud. And look what you're saying. Thank you, Lord, for the cloud you made for me. And it's a testimony now because that's what I'm talking about. It's the Lord. You know? And, um, and I, I never wanted to be alone. I always had to be with somebody. And my wife has been with me for 35 years. You know? And um, like we're inseparable. You know? We got all our problems and things like that. It got so that when I stopped playing, she actually took me out of the business. You know, a lot of women and things like that. You know what I mean. And um, I finally had to psych her into joining the band. I got her to learn how to play the maracas and sing, and now she performs with me. <laughs> so I'm allowed to go everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> We got one more question, Emma, in the back. Yeah, um, we had a guy here in Taiwan called Jeff Mao, and um, he described you as the original Afrocentric Asian. Um, <laughs> and there's a lot of very talented Filipino Americans who have been some sex these days. And I was just wondering if Filipino culture has anything on the other Okay.
a great question. Let me explain. Uh, I think I understand what you're saying, but let me round it out into my story. Here I am, nine years old, and I'm looking in the mirror on a tenement street in 104th Street, and I'm saying, what the hell am I? Hmm. And I look at my hair, and I touch it, and I say, why can't our hair be like this? And you got to understand, growing up at that time, who our heroes were. We didn't have black history. Uh, the music that was played wasn't our own. And I was looking for identity. I was the only kid on the block that was part Filipino and black. Most everybody was Latino. And going to school, I kept thinking that I was shortchanged in life, that I wouldn't be allowed to go here because of the racism that existed in, in the world. Oh, I couldn't go here, and I couldn't do this if I didn't do this. So right away, I was sort of handicapped. It wasn't until later on that I was able to appreciate my heritage, right? Because I grew up with Latinos, and they all thought that I was, I was Spanish. And they would give you an argument. You know, I could speak Spanish. Um, then I had that part of me being black. My mother, you could see, we'd go down to the neighborhood. She was from Newport News, Virginia. There was no mistaking my mother was black, all right? And uh, here growing up, my friends were of all different races. I never had a, a racist body in my, 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 my body until I grew up, until I started seeing the world, until I went down south. And the guy looked at me, and I got on the bus, and uh, I sat where I wanted to sit, because all I know is what I grew up and how I grew up in New York. And they said, Joe, you're crazy. You can't do that. And I said, shit, ain't nobody telling me nothing. I had this attitude. And, you know, and maybe it was a mistake. Nobody bothered me down south. I don't know why. I said, I went to the movies. Ain't nobody touched me. I was waiting. I was hoping somebody say something to me. Mm -hmm. Having grown up in New York, being free to do what I want to do, I, was, I didn't realize I was ignorant about things that they were throwing lie in the pools in St. Augustine in Florida, that they were hanging people, they were shooting people in the back. I had no idea until later on, until I started to become self-conscious and civil rights and the things that, that uh, were being done to us. Then I was angry. And uh, it wasn't until 1976 that I recorded an album. And I said, what the hell am I now? Shit. I'm tired, you know, I keep identifying myself, man. I said, I'm a human being. Why the hell do I got to be anything anyway? So I named the album Afro-Filipino. <laughs> Nobody took notice of the album. The guy asked me to do the song for Chico and the Man with Freddie Prince Actually, and Jose Filiano, so beat, beat me out. my family did. <laughs> okay. I found that out later <laughs> yeah. when we heard about the yellow seed and all the different things that are involved with uh, Filipinos nowadays. I found out there were a lot of Filipinos like me that were of mixed heritage. Mm -hmm. In New York and Abadio, we don't see no Filipinos. The few that we saw used to gamble upstairs, you know. Mm. Uh, Asian people love to gamble, you know. And um, when I went to California, then I started to get a consciousness because I started seeing a lot of Filipinos. And they were just like me, you know. And then I started to realize, hey, I'm part of Filipino. I'd be proud of being part of Filipino and black. And then it came out, and lo and behold, I have a, a, a following now with the Asian community, which is, is a blessing because it's coming forward. Because now, if you will see, when anyone comes to see Joe Batan perform, there's no telling who's in the audience. And it's been like that for some time, and I like it like that. Mm. You know, you don't know who's in that audience. You can't depict that it's one particular nationality. I'm known for a song in every different country. Somebody has a favorite of mine. You know, you can't. I mean, in, when I went to Columbia, South America, they made me get off the plane and they made me sing to <laughs> prove that I was Joe Batan. Because they said, you look like his son. And Joe Batan's got to be about 92 years old in a wheelchair. And you're not going to fool us out here and take our money. So here I was singing a song that was three, three uh, octaves higher than what I did when I was a kid, you know. And they let me come into the country. Um, Japan, I think I was known for the bottle. Uh, New York, ordinary guy. California, Mike Cloud. Uh, UK, I don't know, they, they're starting to play some of the Spanish songs from what I hear. They were playing me all over the radio last year. Uh, Italy, it, it's Rappo Clapo, Latin Strut, ordinary guy, Bossa Nova stuff. So uh, I'm just so gratified and blessed that I'm able to say that, you know, that I've lasted this long. 
and I hope it's just the beginning. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.